Let's, uh, folks, let's get started over here. We got a lot of folks who want to speak. We want to make sure that we give them time to speak. And the first on our list is Gene Stone, followed by Donna Gilmore. So Gene's going to come on up here and establish authority. Okay, let's um, let's get started, please. Pizza's too good. Yeah. Okay, Gene Stone, the floor is yours. Donna, come on over here. You're next. Hello, I'm Gene Stone from uh, Residence Organized for a Safe Environment. Uh, I wanted Please. to comment on the radiation I'm, monitoring. I'm sorry, we're going to start over again here. Hey, folks, it's a pizza party over there, and that's awesome, but we do need to get underway with a public comment period. Okay, let's start over again. Gene. So I wanted to comment on the radiation monitoring. First, I'd like to thank California Edison for working with us on this concept. And as I've said many times, this is still a work in progress from what I've seen. Uh, it's a good start, but there needs to be more discussion about placements of these uh, monitors, how close they are, heat readings, temperature readings as well. So there are other very important issues if we expect this monitoring system to be advantageous, not at least speaking about how do we deal with the independent uh, verification of radiation monitoring. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Donna Gilmore and then Torgan Johnson. Donna Gilmore, the floor is yours. Uh, Donna Gilmore, San Ano for Safety. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk about moving, and, but the weak link is the fact that these canisters can crack, may already be cracked. We know they are already gouged. And they have no way to inspect gouges. And once the canister cracks, the crack continues to grow through the wall. And they have no plan to stop it or prevent it. And the canister, you cannot repair something you can't see. Now you each have, everyone should have a handout. Yours will be smaller than this. <laughs> uh, one side is an NRC document saying it's impossible to inspect and repair these canisters. This is an NRC document. The other document is a page out of Edison's visual assessment report where they claim they you know, inspected a canister. Their report has a special note in it that says, note, this is not an, an inspection by any ASME code or any other code. So you're being misled here. And if you think you're going to transport cracking canisters and, and they have no plan and they want to destroy the pools and there's only two methods and the Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board person will confirm this. There's only two methods to replace canisters in a pool or a hot cell. Edison refuses to believe a hot, um, build a hot cell and they want to destroy the pools. And they told the Coastal Commission, pa Tom Palmazano, who used to work for Edison, got up there and said that they couldn't inspect them. They've already inspected eight. And, and they've repaired. You know, um, you know I'm, I'm sorry, but th this is a lie, to be blunt. The bottom line is, you wouldn't even buy a car you couldn't inspect, repair, or get a warning symbol. Forget me on the camera. Put this on the camera. You wouldn't even get a, you know. So the, the, the standard in the world is thick wall casts that are so thick we don't have to worry about cracks. They can be open. They can be inspected. They can be maintained. Edison didn't want to pick those because it was going to take it longer to get it out of the pools, for one, and that was going to cost them money. So you ever want to know why Edison does something, look for the money trail. And this north wind, um, they, they were, well, uh, I was supposed to be 
interviewed by them, I said, unless you're going to deal with the technical issues on how we're going to get this stuff out of here, I don't want to talk to you. It's not worth my time. Um, so that's, that's the truth. And if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, I have all the technical evidence from national labs, from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, you know, other evidence. And I really didn't want to spend my retirement studying nuclear waste, but um, we, you know, we, we're going to have to deal with this and get the truth out so we can have a real solution for ma maintaining this waste safely and get it in condition where it can be transported. Okay. Thank you very Thank much you. for your comment. Next is Torgan Johnson and then Lindsay Bazet. Torgan Johnson, the floor is yours. Torgan Johnson. I'm a Harvard-trained urban planner, two graduate degrees in planning. I also have a professional degree in architecture from USA, so I build things. Public Aquarius, one of them. But more importantly, I'm a father of four living downwind of this decommissioning project. So my first thought is not so fast. I heard the talk today. And uh, the number one issue for the public is robust containment of the radioactive waste. And what SCE is leaving behind on site when the $4.4 billion decommissioning money is gone. San Onofre's 3.6 million pounds of high-level radioactive waste is being stranded on the coast indefinitely, making robust containment with an emergency plan B, the most critical issue given the uncertainty of a viable deep repository concept ever being developed in our lifetime. Restoring the ocean views is meaningless compared to the morally bankrupt dumping of dangerous waste on the public in damaged canisters either here or in New Mexico. The reality is that the waste is stranded here indefinitely in a salt environment that experiences episodic wet and dry conditions. According to the engineering journal Corrosion in October 2013, there is uncertainty how corrosion damage accumulates and grows between successive events of fluctuating humid humidity like we have here at San Onofre. All stainless steel canisters are stranded and damaged by contact with carbon steel. This is from Edison's own documentation. The galvanic corrosion that results becomes a huge aging management issue since there's no means of accurately assessing the three-wall cracking of canisters. Edison lacks a way to measure the corrosion cracking damage to the canisters despite very deceptive worded reassurances to the contrary. By Edison's own admission, the inspections done last year are not a formal inspection or activity qualified to ASNA standards. Here's another damaged canister, 120 inches long, scratched down this thing. Tiny pits in stainless steel initiate corrosion cracking. This is massive damage by comparison. <clears throat> Edison lacks a procedure to handle damage and leaking canisters, and that was made clear after the near-drop events were made public last year. The spent fuel pools need to stay on site as long as the nuclear waste is on site. Edison lacks a place to send the damage in corroding canisters despite reassurances that other states will be competing for the honor to host our deadly waste. They don't want it, and they're gearing up for a protracted legal fight to keep it that way. Edison is reluctant to correct the defective engineering of the transfer rig, the storage vaults, and the damaged canisters, and the absurdly bad location for the ISFACI. Um, that, in Edison terms, is what is commercially reasonable. Edison is moving ahead with the demolition of the spent fuel poles, the only means for handling a damaged and leaking canister. From the public's perspective, Edison never intended to move the nuclear waste off-site. The plan was to strand it on-site as cheaply as possible in order to start the deconstruction of the buildings and infrastructure to access the $4.4 billion decommissioning fund that you collected from all of us over 40 years. You're ditching the waste without a viable plan to even reload a damaged canister. Thank you. I'm going to finish up. The public wants to halt Holtec and SCE's insanely half-baked nuclear waste plan so that you can give real answers to the real concerns the public has about your long-term safety, about our long-term safety. Thank you very much for your comment. We Lindsay have no Bazette. confidence that you have our safety or best interest in mind. Lindsay Bazet and then Gary Hedrick, please.
Good evening, panel members. I'm frankly sickened by uh, all the presentations and really glossing over the, the reality that we could have a very contaminated site here at the end of this decommissioning process. We could also have, uh, as we know, uh, cracked canisters in as few as one more year. We have 16-year-old canisters on site and nobody's talking about it. What's going on here? I'm gonna read my, my talk here though. I'm a mother of four young children. I live 30 miles from San Onofre. My concern is the safety of my family and my commu community from radiological contamination by a nuclear waste canister breach or sloppy decommissioning process at San Onofre. You may not know this, but Southern California Edison has a track record of gross misinformation and omissions from its media and public outreach to the detriment of the public's safety and public interest. The public needs to know this, as today, we're very likely facing yet another episode of Edison's misinformation and omission of information that would otherwise allow us to protect our lives, the lives of our families, and our livelihoods. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, when my husband was a boy growing up in Malibu, Southern California Edison and Rocketdyne experimented with sodium nuclear reactors, and as a result of their poor judgment, were responsible for several nuclear accidents that spread radio radioactive fallout at the Santa Susana Field Lab in Simi Valley, only 15 miles from his home. To date, 180 families have been compensated for the deaths of their young children due to highly unusual cancers and leukemias caused by that accident. The Santa Susana Field Lab site continues to be highly contaminated today, despite the outcries of so many families. In 2012, Southern California Edison's faulty engineering permanently and prematurely shut down the operation of San Onofre due to gross engineering deficiencies and once again poor judgment resulting in leaking steam generators. The public was charged $3.3 billion for this blunder and Edison took no responsibility and instead tried to blame Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. In August of 2018, Edison came close to triggering a nuclear disaster for Southern California when a temp worker nearly dropped a 54-ton canister of high-level radioactive waste from an 18-foot height. We all know this. It took a whistleblower, not Edison, to bring this to light and inform the public. In November of 2018, Edison's poor judgment once again and faulty engineered power grid burned down half of my husband's hometown of Malibu when the Woolsey fire began at the Santa Susana Field Lab contaminated site. Edison does not tell you about any of these historic or recent events when they tell you to just trust us. The truth is, the public does not trust you, Edison. And your poor judgment and faulty engineering is clearer than ever with this half-baked nuclear waste storage plan. What the public sees is that Edison has terrible judgment and even worse engineering practices. Please do the prudent thing. Stop loading San Onofre's high-level radioactive waste into defective thin-walled nuclear waste storage system. Please replace the defective Holtec thin-walled storage system with a proven thick-walled cask storage system that can be inspected, monitored, and maintained. Thank and then very... get it off our beach. Th thank you very much for your comment, Gary Hedrick, and then George Allen. Please. Uh, hello, Gary Hedrick, San Clemente Green. I just really appreciate the previous speakers, and I would like to, you know, acknowledge what what CEP has done too. Reminding me about the letter that you wrote to criticizing Holtec was a major point in your favor, and I also want to acknowledge Brett Leslie for communicating with me through emails and in person uh, to help me understand better what the report was actually about. And I write a newsletter whenever, ever so often, a couple, once every two weeks or so. In my last newsletter, I made a, the wrong connection between what the DOE, I mean, what the Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board was saying and connecting it to our particular site when that's not even their purview. So. I was cleared up on that, but there's things that were mentioned in this report that you just can't help but make a connection to, you know, connect the dots. And even though what he said, neither 
tells us that the containers we're using here at our site are safe or not, that's not their purview. They're, once they take possession for transportation, that's what he was talking about. So I was glad to have that um, correction, and I will make sure I make that clear in my next newsletter. But I just want to read the, the short paragraph that really caught my attention and see if you might have made the same mistake in assuming that uh, you know, it might have to do with San Onofre. A recommendation number three on page 34. The board recommends that for planning purposes, DOE should allow for a minimum of a decade to develop new cask and canister designs for spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste storage and transportation. Or the DOE should conduct its own detailed evaluation of the time needed to complete the design licensing, fabrication, and testing of new casks and canisters. And when I read that, I felt like that is another example of this you know, independent organization formed by the National Academy of Sciences telling us about a situation that may not apply to us directly, but they're very reliable. And I really trust and appreciate the reporting that they have done in the past, too. We should learn from this, even if it's a not, not a direct connection, but you know, they're not saying we're safe. This, is, this report is not about San Onofre, and yet some of their research and findings, I think they apply to us, and we better listen up. Thank you very much uh, for your comment. George Allen and then Ray Lutz. George Allen, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, my name is George Allen. I've worked at San Onofre for over 30 years. I live in San Clemente, and uh, I uh, have been a radiation protection technology person, and I tune up the instruments to verify they read, uh, you know, what they're supposed to read. So uh, I've been around a while. But uh, one of the things, uh, a man wrote a book, and he said, overwhelming evidence has to be presented to uh, kind of explain when things aren't true, which I don't think uh, this group is being truthful. Um, there are 3,000 nuclear canisters in storage that have been in storage for 25 years, and there has not been a leak. And the site boundary is 25 millirem at the site boundary, and that has not been exceeded. Uh, your natural background radiation is somewhere in the neighborhood of 620 millirem. So people living near those areas are getting less than tenth of their natural background radiation from living near a uh, waste site. So I think they're overstating the danger. And if you really uh, are afraid 30 miles away that uh, you could be exposed to radiation, please study the science, because that's scaring your, yourself. You shouldn't scare yourself. You should realize that's not true. But anyways, I, I want to follow up with a, what uh, Mario Estrada said last time at the uh, meeting down in San Diego. He said he felt this was one of the safest places he's worked at. And I'll say it's as safe as any place I've worked at. That's what the NRC is trying to do, is make it as safe as any other job that a person would want. Um, we do have safety meetings every day. That's one of our highest priorities, to go home safe. And uh, so anyway, um, the, the NRC has set limits that are safe. We implement those limits, and these detectors that are out there, you'll probably find out that you're not getting much more than less than 25 millirem a year by living there, and that's not a health hazard. So thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, next, is, next is Ray Lutz and then Stephen Vogue. Okay, Ray Lutz with Citizens Oversight. Thank you for giving me the time. So the five favorite words of the nuclear industry are, we'll figure it out later. And we've heard that tonight. We've had the nuclear um, you know, waste technical review board that's just getting started talking about maybe they're going to develop something. We have the expert teams that have been working for two years. And this is the first time we've heard anything, and there's been no reports about what they've been doing. I had to confront SCE tonight to say all the reports that I get and that are on the website say nothing's been done. So now we're going to get started. We have a new group and maybe something's going to be done. Or is this just a tactic to delay? I'm pretty disappointed in the progress so far. 
Um, is it to just kick the can down the road with no result again? Is this, and we heard about, this is a problem we have in this country. We've got corporations with, they have the horizon of planning is the next quarterly meeting, next quarterly report, and we're trying to make decisions for thousands of years. So I want to give some direction. This is a conduit. This is conduit to SCE, all right? I'm not asking you a question. I'm telling you what to do. Uh, and the expert teams. The federal policy, by the way, of using Yucca Mountain was a, a, a fraud. There's no way this hot waste is going into that mountain, even if it was open today. It's far too hot. Uh, it's way too hot to, to put in there, and it would be, it would, they would have to, they say, in their plan is to cool it with active fans for 150 years. That's pretty stupid. Moving the waste there wouldn't be easy also. The, the railroad goes right through Las Vegas, right by Trump Tower, try doing that. That's certainly a political issue. Putting it under the Yucca Mountain, they say, well, that's not a technical issue, it's all political. No, it's a very seriously difficult technical issue. So now, couldn't we get it to move the 1,350 miles over to New Mexico? Is that going to be feasible? Yeah, you can put it on railroad cars and feasibly they could roll there. But politically, it's going to be very difficult to make that happen. The Pendleton option, putting it five miles in on Camp Pendleton, must be on the list of things that are explored. So please do that. We need to find possible locations in Camp Pendleton, have them explore which ones, and then set something aside in case everything else goes wrong and in case there's a catastrophe where we have to move it quickly. We need to have a place to move it as a backup. Let's not follow that same thing of let's figure it out later. Let's figure it out now. So we want to change the plan. So please consider the, the Pendleton option and also the Helms criterion of having a dual layer canister. Put that in your list of things to do. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Stephen Vogue and then Darl Gale. Stephen, Dr. Stephen Vogue. Hi, yeah, I'm Dr. Stephen Vogue. And um, I was listening to the guy who was up here beforehand who worked there talking about how safe it was to work there and how we're scaring ourselves if we think it's not safe and so on. And uh, I'll bet it really is safe there until it isn't. I, um, I've been hearing a lot about safety here this evening uh, from the um, NRC and Edison and how, how wonderfully safe everything can be. And they're, they're wanting to make everything safe. However, given that the global climate predictions show that ocean levels are expected to rise substantially over the next few years, why is it that the NRC is allowing Edison to store radioactive canisters a few feet above the present sea level? Uh, question one, is that safe? Well, it is for now, until it isn't. When the Fukushima disaster occurred because of an earthquake and resulting tsunami, uh, one wonders why does the NRC and Edison think that it's safe to store radioactive canisters on the beach near known geological fault lines. I'm sure it's safe until it isn't. It seems evident to me that the NRC and Edison's actions belie their ongoing statements about safety. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, next is Darl Gale and then Krista Gotzenhofer. Darl Gale, the floor is yours. Hi, Darl Gale. Um, I went to that horrible Chula Vista Coastal Commission meeting, and I was very curious about the mechanical contraption that uh, Palm, Tom Palmazano was showing us that looked like an old Hoover vacuum cleaner, and he was saying that don't worry about the cracks in the canisters because this this robotic thing will just squirt hot metal stuff into it, and and everything will be fine, and don't worry about a cracked canister. So like I, I went on Google and I looked and looked and couldn't find anything about something that would 
fix a whole tech canister, but I did find the YouTube from t October 2014 where the head of whole tech was saying, well, we can't really repair cracked canisters. But the Coastal Commission, especially the head of it, was like going, oh yeah, that's good, I'm, I'm, I feel great, that's fine, you, you know, go ahead and dismantle the whole plant. So if Edison is just gonna leave and, and take everything away and all these people at the Coastal Commission were so excited that Edison was leaving, they seemed to ignore the fact that they were leaving the nuclear waste there on the ground all that radioactive waste. So who's going to monitor? I mean, I'm glad that Gene Stone has got some monitors um, around the, you know, we have monitors around the plant, but I was just thinking about, well, who's going to be really there after Edison leaves? The, the, the NRC, the state of California, a private contractor, the city of San Clemente, Camp Pendleton? Are they going to be watching out and monitoring it? Or is it going to be a bunch of unpaid, terrified residents walking around with little Geiger counters? So I have a real hard time trusting Edison that, that they're going to just leave no hot cell, no cooling pool, and it really worries me. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, next is Krista Gostenhofer and then Kathy Luane. Krista Gostenhofer, are you here? I'm blowing the whistle on this whole show. Uh, we'll figure it out later. That's the basic theme. And it has been a long game of kick the can. And I say, all the oxen free. It's time that all of the parties involved stop and communicate with each other because we are getting ourselves into a big jam. The combination of dysfunction, poor communication, deception, lies, is really not okay. For people who are in the reactor communities, but possibly watching this uh, presentation, uh, Edison does a very glossy, convincing, professional job of presenting their thing. But if you notice, we were not allowed even a peep if someone said something false, like the ISFACI is eight and a half feet above sea level. We're not allowed to say anything. Um, the CE process is not a two-way communication. Uh, let's see. The Rocky Flats Wildlife Preserve is a very toxic space. The cancers in that area are serious. It is not safe for uh, the public. All right, the people who I'm blowing the whistle on are Edison, no, the CEP, Edison, Holtec, the NRC, the California Coastal Commission, the State Lands Commission, the Public Utility Commission, Congress, and the DOE. If these entities do not start acting like a functional humanity to address the national imminent crisis of nuclear waste in this country, then we are really in deep trouble. I could go down the reasons of why I call out each of those things. Edison, for example, should have stopped, I'm calling, I'm blowing the whistle on Edison. Edison did not stop loading at canister one. They had problems loading, they know it was damaged, they did not stop. They've done everything they can to defend Holtec. Holtec has never come forward to uh, address all of the problems with that system. And they're delivering a damaged product. Uh, to be continued. Congress is passing 
Congress is considering H.R. 2699, which it is impossible for them to read the bill. It's impossible. It's 50 pages of edits going into the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Unless you spend two weeks doing the edits and they have a red line document, we cannot know what that document says. I don't know who's promoting it or why, but we certainly haven't had a red line document anywhere publicly submitted. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, Kathy Lawane and then Brian Johnson. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Yes, it's uh, Iwane. Um, it's Japanese. I lived in Japan. My name is Kathy, by the way, and I'm, uh, I was in Japan for 25 years. I'm a translator by trade. And I, was in, I wasn't in Fukushima. I was 380 miles away from Fukushima when that went down. Interestingly enough, the thick-walled casks on site at Fukushima in dry, storing dry waste 19-inch thick-walled casts um, after the huge, huge tsunami and numerous aftershocks, huge earthquake, remain to this day unscathed. Please research that. It's very important. Okay. So, according to the Nuclear Waste Technical Review and Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 82, Holtec, the maker of these canisters and loading system at Songs, is completely not in compliance. Put simply, this policy act mandates that nuclear waste must be able to be inspected inside and outside the canisters. Edison admits on their website, visual assessment is not an inspection on their own website, citing wear marks, carbon steel contamination, and fabrication artifacts. Yet, they told the coastal, commission, coastal commissioners on October 16th that some canisters were inspected. That's interesting. David Victor goes on television last week at KUSI Newsroom and tells the public that inspections have indeed taken place and these canisters are safe. The Coastal Commission should revoke its permit to decommission because even the NRC admits it's impossible to inspect or repair canisters. Yet, Edison and NRC told the Coastal Commission that they can. Our waste must be monitored, repaired, and maintained. It's not happening. Our waste must be transportable. Why is it not happening? These Holtec canisters are welded shut, and we know from NRC reports that the canisters are scratched, gouged, due to Holtec's defective loading system. Department of Energy tells us that scratched, gouged canisters cannot be transported when and if a national <coughs> repository is established. Even Holtec International is in violation of their own final safety analysis report that guarantees no scraping and gouging during the loading of the canisters. What's happening here? Why is Edison and the NRC turning a blind eye to the reality? Finally, this question is for the chairman, David Victor. I'm curious, where's the huge amounts of analysis demonstrating the impact of the near-miss canister hitting the ground? David Victor made these statements on the air last week. Where's the evidence for these bold statements? Please join me in contacting your electeds to blow the whistle on these blatant inconsistencies threatening the uninsurable loss of lives and property should an accident occur. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next is Brian Johnson and then Jack, uh, looks like Thorworth. Brian Johnson and then Jack Thorworth. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Brian Johnston. I'm an aerospace systems engineer, recently retired from Northrop Grumman. My job there was to develop requirements for safely, safely launching and operating both low Earth and geocentric uh, uh, satellites. Um, you know, to paraphrase uh, an oftentimes used phrase, this isn't rocket science. It's much more difficult than rocket science because rocket science Satellite launches can be postponed for weather, uh, for range conditions, for any kind of other issues, but this plan is sort of sitting there, um, subject to the weather, to the seas, to the ocean, and to the earth movements. And my question I have for you, <clears throat> that can be answered uh, next time you have a meeting, is the seawall protecting San Onofre site from tsunamis is 28 feet high. That's slightly less than the 33-foot 
seawall that was at Fukushima to protect it from, uh, from tsunamis. Unfortunately, during the earthquake, a 42-foot tsunami hit Fukushima and caused the explosions in, <clears throat> in the reactors one, two, and three. What's going to be the effect of a 40-foot tsunami hitting the San Onofre site when there is dry cast storage, when we don't know whether there's cracks or corrosion that's unseen and undetected in those casks. I used to own a sailboat. All the appliances, all the fittings on a sailboat are by necessity stainless steel because of the corrosion due to ocean um, and the atmosphere around the ocean. But as you all know, if you have a sailboat, those things have to be, have to be rep replaced every five or six years just because stainless steel does corrode. And if there's corrosion and then there's seawater pouring into these dry cast storage, what's going to be the effect and what's going to be the possible outcome? I'll wait for your answer at your next CEP meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Jack, Jack Thorworth and then it uh, looks like P. Gracia. Have I pronounced it, Mr. Thorworth? Yeah, Have I pronounced you sure your name? I sure did. Okay. I did not fill out a form to make a comment. If you'll notice, that's crossed out. I had questions. I was hoping you would read the question and then answer it. Would you try that for me? I, I can read. Would you like would, me to read? Yes, I would like you yeah. to read it out loud and then answer it. Well, so I'll read the question and then we'll give answers at the end. Oh, sure. Is that acceptable to you? Sure. Okay. Uh, what is the life expectancy of the canisters and what happens then? Why were thin canisters chosen instead of dry casks used in Europe? How is leaking radiation detected in the flimsy Edison canisters? And okay. the, answer, the answers are? Well, as I said, we're going to give you the answers at the end of the public comment period. Oh, just okay. what I would expect. Later. We'll get the answers later. Yeah, so actually we've answered several of these already tonight and repeatedly, but we'll give them additional answers uh, in a moment. So, P. Gracias. Gracia, have I pronounced? And then Mandy Sackett. Help me, I can't read the handwriting here. Yes, it's Gracian. I didn't intend to speak. I made a comment there, but it's about the same thing. I think it's insane and crazy that we should be put through this suffering of having to fear uh, for uh, everyone's safety. Uh, it's it's uh, just stupid, I'd say, to decide to put uh, such dangerous materials into canisters that, by all descriptions here, are not uh, uh, sensible in any way. They are extremely thin compared to what is used and more uh, in countries that care about their citizens. And uh, that's, I'm just uh, protesting that. And uh, you, you should not continue on this path. I don't understand how, how so anybody who has a brain continues on a path that leads to very bad results. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you for your comment. Next is Mandy Sackett. And then qu card number 16 uh, is asking the question about are you pursuing, I believe, Yucca Mountain for long-term storage, but there's no name on it. So if you are number 16 or interested in Yucca Mountain, you're next after Mandy Sackett. Mandy Sackett, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you, Mandy Sackett. I'm the California Policy Coordinator for the Surfrider Foundation, also a resident of San Clemente. Um, I just first want to sincerely thank Edison for their commitment for a more robust ocean and nearshore monitoring plan moving forward. They committed at our request at the State Lands Commission recently issued um, lease to include additional monitoring locations, um, including near recreational sites at San Onofre, and to make all of their monitoring data public with at least monthly reports posted online. Um, we are really hoping that this monitoring data will be displayed in some type of a really user-friendly interactive map. I think user-friendly is really key there. The public could visit any time um, and, you know, click on the different monitoring locations, see relevant data, find the most recent monitoring data, and as well as archive data. So we're hoping to see that come to fruition very soon. Thank you again. 
Um, it also includes, um, as I mentioned tonight, the batch release notifications and also groundwater level monitoring. Um, we're very concerned about the potential for sea level rise and impacts to the ISFCE. So if as um, sea level rise, the groundwater also rises and which could also, you know, which could flood the ISFCE indefinitely. And so we wanna make sure that they're keeping a really close eye on that. Um, and then on another note, um, we at Surfrider are really greatly disappointed at Edison's unwillingness to commit to ensuring to a readily deployable on-site canister repair mechanism um, to be available before the cooling pools are dismantled. To date, the cooling pools are an important option that should remain available to repackage spent fuel in the event of a damaged canister. It's risky and very irresponsible for Edison not to have that commitment and a plan in place for emergencies, why would we not? We urged Coastal Commission staff to include that commitment in their coastal development permit, and they agreed pending Edison's approval, but Edison would not agree. They claim that they will have a repair mechanism before the cooling pools are dismantled, dismantled but refusing to commit, and I find that very confusing. Um, this feels like Edison is being dismissive of public concerns. I agree with that, which has been mentioned tonight. It shows a level of arrogance, and I think is the root of many of our fears here tonight. And it's a great lack of regard for precautionary planning. So I hope, Edison, that you will develop a plan in time. I hope it will be more robust than the supersonic crack repair robot thing that was shown at the Coastal Commission meeting. We need a hot cell or some way to really truly repair and repackage canisters in the unlikely event that it is needed. So thank you for your time tonight. Thank you for your comment. Um, number, number 16 is number 16 who wants to talk about pursuing Yucca Mountain for long-term storage here. If you discover that you're number 16 later, let me know. Uh, Charles Langley and then nine of Babiars. Charles Langley, the f you're number 17. Uh, the floor is yours. Greetings, I'm Charles Langley with Public Watchdogs. And the first thing I wanted to uh, note was something that Donna touched on briefly earlier, and this is a document on Edison letterhead it says, it's referring to the visual inspection using the camera, the robotic camera system. And it says, note, this is not a scare quote, formal inspection or an activity qualified to ASME sections three, five or 11. And I'm concerned about that because <clears throat> I believe this was the inspection that Southern California Edison told the Coastal Commission was a real inspection. They said we'd inspected the cans. And uh, here we're saying, well, it isn't a formal inspection. <clears throat> so I just wanted to draw attention to that. The second issue I have is about scratching and cracking. Now, Tom Palmasano had said that the scratches on these cans, many of them are one thirty-five thousandth of an inch thick. But we've got a photograph from a FOIA request here, and these look like really deep gouges. They look almost like machine cuts. They look a lot deeper than a thirty-five thousandth of an inch or the thickness of a credit card. The second photo I saw that particularly alarmed me was this one, and this is from a FOIA request. And it shows a Southern California Edison MPC 37 Holtec canister. And what you're looking at is a stain on the side of the canister. And I'd like you to look at this. This is 316L austenitic stainless steel, the same stuff that these canisters are made out of. And you can see the same type of staining. If you come up after and touch it, you'll see that it's almost a crust. That's corrosion. These canisters are corrosion, corroding, and we have photos of it right here. Cans are already corroding. I just want the community engagement panel to be aware of that. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, Nina Babiars and then Jeff Steinmetz. Good evening. My name is Nina Babiars. I'm a board member of Public Watchdogs. And uh, I'd first like to acknowledge the appreciation for Jim Desmond uh, and the questions that he raised. And I hope that it inspires some of the other CEP members to ask pertinent questions. Because after all, if all these people in our community are doing their homework and asking these questions, I think it's about time that some of the members of the CEP step up. Uh, I wasn't planning to talk about this, but you know, I, I noticed that uh, all the resumes here are peppered with DOE, re, you know, retired former employees, and I'm just curious. My mother used to have a, a, a quote that applies to some of my comments and questions tonight, and that is, you know, somebody didn't have, have gone to the College of Common Sense, because if these people could have found a solution while they were working for DOE, I think the last count was they were giving over 40 40 years and $40.2 billion, why can we assume that they're going to find a solution now? Just my comment. Please let her... And I do finish. have a, a few questions that I'd like either uh, Dan or Jerry to pose at the end of this uh, uh, session. Uh, first of all, uh, Lou Bosch, you know, you were talking about uh, the... Uh, incidents or the issues that occurred. Greg Warner came out on August the 20th from the NRC, gave us an update of the resumption of the burial, outlined issues, employees walking under a downloading process, shutting down the loading process for hours. Another employee uh, implemented a ventilation that was not even a procedure for San Onofre. Obviously, some of the mistakes that were made again and again, the corrective action that the NRC had demanded from uh, training and management uh, were obviously not effective. But I had posed a question to Greg Warnick, what was the date uh, that that incident issue that he was referring to occurred? Never got an answer, so I'd appreciate, Lou, if you could give us an answer as to when, after resumption of the burial, did that occur? Ron, question. You were talking about your EIR and the State Lands Commission. Uh, public watchdogs had to ask for the exclusion area plan. The exclusion area plan in the permit for Edison's Coastal Commission permit. And specifically, it impacts public access and recreational opportunities. I would hope, and I'm, my question is, will you bring a copy of the exclusion area plan into the next CEP meeting so that the public can be aware that part of that plan and part of that exclusion extends to the entrance of the surfing beach to the north and the camping entrance to the south. Doug Bowder, question. Please help me understand. When you talk about the competitive bidding process, how you define that now that we know that both Energy Solutions and AECOM were conducting the original cost analysis of the work that they're going to be doing back in 2014. That flies in the face of common sense. So my question is, how can you define that as the competitive bidding process when those two contractors, your joint venture, developed the original cost analysis? Well, I guess it's not uh, you know, logical. It's logical then that they could come in under budget. Thank you very much for your comments. And David Victor, I'd just like to know, Do because I'm so disappointed that you would go on KUSI and not identify yourself as the chair of the Southern California Edison Community Engagement Panel. It was deceptive by its omission. Thank you very much for your comments. Jeff Steinmetz, and then Chiwa Slater. Wow. I'm normally the guy that's calling you out for liars. Seems like just about everybody's up here doing it today. So it's leaving me with a little bit less to say. So thank you. I appreciate it. You know, I don't like having the responsibility of calling everybody out. But there are still a few things unsaid. <clears throat> Lou Bosch, how is it that you lit worked at San Onofre all those years when they had the worst safety record 
And this is by employees that would have worked underneath you. <clears throat> and you're so such a big advocate for safety. What is it that you were doing that was so wrong? How did you fail so often? <clears throat> Another thing. It's my understanding that Lou Bosch worked at San Onofre on August 3rd, 2018, when the near canister dropped. <clears throat> he just got up here and said, there were two people handling the canisters. Two. In the same presentation tonight, he said they now have 13, and it's god on the right amount. Well, gee, Lou, didn't you know that on August the 3rd? What were you thinking? Don't you have a clue? <clears throat> um, as far as the information that's presented, please don't insult everybody's intelligence over and over again with statements like very low releases. That's not a quantifiable qu amount. And it's ridiculous that they should stand up here and you should listen to such statements without calling them on it over and over again. David Victor, you've also been called out a couple of times tonight as well. But nobody's actually caught you on the thing that I think is most interesting. At Kohlberg, at the last CEP meeting that you talked so vehemently about, that, you know, guess what? They selected Holtec. All you guys are so worried that they selected Holtec. There's nothing to be worried about. And then this gentleman here went on with his presentation, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, about how thick is not good and thin is better. <clears throat> well, David Victor, you failed to mention that that canister that Kohlberg selected was a thick canister produced by Holtec. How did that happen, Dave? Did you just forget? Or did you um, purposely omit that information? Or were you just too stupid to recognize it? Or too lazy to look it up? We looked it up. Thank you very much for your comments. Chiwa Slater and then Kevin Why don't Higgins. you do your job? Thank you for your comments. And act responsibly. Chiwa. And look up the information Chiwa. next time, David. Thank you for your comments. Chiwa Slater and I'm then sure Kevin I'm sure you're really Higgins. happy about them. Chiwa Slater. Thank you. Chiwa Slater and then Kevin Higgins. I'm Chiwa Slater. I'm a resident of Oceanside and a member of the very, very concerned public. A couple of years ago, a friend of mine posted something on Facebook about what's happening at San Onofre. And she said, my gosh, we're toast. I said, no, it can't be that bad. So I started looking into it. And I did it with an open mind. I really wanted to find that it wasn't that bad. But it is that bad. We are toast, unless you do something differently than what you've been doing. I want to thank you for the beautiful picture that you painted us here of what things are going to look like after decommissioning. The sky was even bluer. A friend asked me the other day why I've been thinking of moving out of San Diego, and I said, because I can see that disaster here is imminent. So she sent me an article on Chernobyl that somebody had written about how beautiful Chernobyl is and we should all vacation there. And in the article, went on and on and on about how wonderful it is and how safe the people in Chernobyl feel working at the plant. And then it said, and I pretty much quote, Except for the thousands who died of thyroid cancer, there really hasn't been much since then. Well, we are the thousands who are set to die of thyroid cancer. I live 31 miles from the plant, and you can't tell me that the radiation from that plant, when those canisters leak, because they will leak. And if all of us are talking about the canisters needing to be replaced by thick casks, that's because that's the key issue here. The issues that you're presenting are beside the point. Unless you 
unless you put Please the waste into thick walled canisters that can be inspected and then can be moved away when we find a place to move them to, we're toast. So I'm just disgusted. I'm not afraid because I know my life is eternal. But I'm dismayed that this is what we're going to be leaving our younger generations. And I went to the, I've been to NRC meetings where they got up and talked about the standards that they use being the industry standards. These are the standards that apply, they said, to the auto industry and the airplane industry. Well, the auto industry and the airplane industry are not the nuclear industry. And at that same meeting, Representative Levin got up and said that what we need is not just sufficient measures, seemingly sufficient measures, that wasn't the word, it was something like that. What we need are extreme safety measures. That's what we need. We need extreme safety measures. We need to know that we are safe to live here, that we don't have to leave San Diego, because not everybody here can leave San Diego. There are too far too many of us, and we're all endangered, and it's your fault. Thank you very much for your comments. Next is Kevin Higgins and then Mrs. Douglas. Kevin Higgins. Last comment of the evening will be from Mrs. Douglas. Is Mrs. Douglas here? Okay, we're going to...